Brian Mensch is here. He is here to discuss an article he wrote for Truth Out entitled Autism Nation, America's Chemical Brain Drain. Dr. Brian Mensch is president of the Utah Physicians for a Healthy Environment. Hello, Brian. Welcome back to Truth Out Interview. No, thanks for having me. Absolutely. You know, studies are showing that autism is on the rise in the United States by a staggering uh, amount. The, the numbers are actually quite staggering. Now, there's a lot of press in the popular press dedicated to autism, and usually when that, uh, when when the press talks about autism, the name Jenny McCarthy comes up. And Jenny McCarthy it was an actress, uh, former Playboy playmate. She's become this advocate for this sort of anti-vaccine advocate, saying that it is vaccines that cause autism. But I wanted to get that out of the way at the beginning because your article doesn't even bother to address that point of view, but rather it is about the environment and how the environment may contribute to levels of autism, specifically the kind of toxins that are in the environment. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Well, a number of studies suggest that in fact, the um, truly alarming epidemic of autism is a combination of probably genetic susceptibility and environmental triggers. A uh, study done out of Stanford University, not mentioned in the article, uh, suggested that maybe a third of the overall um, autism issue was in fact a genetic propensity, but two thirds was probably environmental triggers of genetically susceptible individuals. Uh, some other research suggests that, in fact, uh, the genetic susceptibility is that some people don't have the same ability to produce a detoxifier called glutathione. And so if you expose two children to the same amount of, say, an environmental trigger, and one of them has less of a genetic uh, propensity to form glutathione, that, that one child from the exact same exposure may have the end result of having some form of autism when the other child did not. So the environmental exposure can be exactly the same, but one child's genetic susceptibility can be much different. So it's probably a combination of both things, but we can't change genetic susceptibility, but we can change environmental exposures. And so that's what we really ought to focus on. And there's really kind of a disconnect now between research that's going on throughout the country seemingly focused on genetic influences when actually it's it should be environmental triggers to get most of the most of the funding and most of the attention well i think that you, you raise a good point and as any good scientist would tell you is that oftentimes there are multi-causal uh factors that go into something as complex as explaining autism so you can't you can't just focus on the environment and you can't just focus on the genetics of it and that's almost undoubtedly the case here. And the, and the other thing is that autism needs to be understood. It's not just one single entity. It's a whole spectrum of, um, say, brain dysfunction. It can be uh, mild, almost imperceptible, to very severe and, and debilitating. So autism uh, shouldn't be associated with uh, one particular entity, one particular celebrity, or one particular cause. And it's unfortunate, as you mentioned, that autism is almost uh, paired invariably with uh, the issue of vaccines. That's a separate issue, which the, my article didn't address, and I certainly I intentionally left that out. But I wanted to address the scientific evidence that chemical exposures seem to play a significant role in what appears to be a genuine public health crisis. The one thing that I was thinking about when I was reading your article is the genetically modified organisms that, uh, or, or foods, genetically, genetically modified foods. Here in California, that was where I am, there was a labeling uh, initiative to label foods that were genetically modified. Now, in your article, you talk a little bit about, or actually a good chunk of it, is about genetically modified foods and how that may be a factor within rates of autism. Why is that? The impetus for genetically modified organisms, at least the high volume um, genetically modified foods, are one of two things. One, either the, um, the plant has had DNA translocated into it so that, in fact, the plant produces its own toxin or pesticide. The other impetus is that um, 
DNA is inserted into the plant that allows it to be resistant to the, applic the external application of, in many cases, massive amounts or frequent rounds of pesticides. So in, in both cases, it's an issue of we're trying to engineer plants that uh, either create their own poison or are resistant to chemical poisons. So the end result is human beings that eat that food are going to be exposed to more chemical poisons, either from application to the plant or from from the fact that they're actually internalized into the plant. Well, now that's not a good thing for anybody. And people ought to be able to understand, at least from um, a 30,000 foot level, that in fact, more chemical exposure really is not a good idea. Take the developing human embryo. There's not a single chemical that enhances or improves the development of a fetus. But we know there are hundreds of chemicals that cause harm. And a, a good many of those are in the category of pesticides. And one of them I was uh, that I wanted to bring up was this chemical that's in Roundup, which is a popular herbicide. And people use it to get rid of weeds. And it's called glyphosate, right? Is that how you say it? Well, Roundup is the most popular selling pesticide in the world. Uh, and um, per volume basis, it's the most widely used throughout the world. And... And so uh, it's distressing to people like me to think that very little has gone on really to exonerate this pesticide that has become almost ubiquitous in use. And there's plenty of scientific evidence that suggests that, in fact, it has some real health consequences. So um, the fact that we've now engineered food that can, or crops that can resist repeated applications of glyphosate. What does this do to the endocrine system, this chemical? In the case of a fetus, the developing fetus, uh, a normal functioning endocrine system is absolutely essential to the development of the brain. And if you do anything chemically to alter the endocrine system during the em embryonic development, you can permanently and irreversibly alter how brain architecture evolves, especially during the critical weeks of gestation from, say, conception up to about 30 weeks. So what we're finding, in fact, is that these kinds of chemicals, glyphosate being one of them, many of them can cross the placenta and actually start to interfere with that critical developmental window uh, up to about 30 weeks and have a profound effect on brain development. And another study quoted in the article um, published about two weeks ago in the, New England, in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is probably the world's most prestigious medical journal, suggested that, in fact, children who uh, had autism and then died of unrelated causes, and then uh, researchers were allowed to do autopsies of their brains, showed that, in fact, children who had autism had architectural abnormalities in their cerebral cortex. Um, those particular abnormalities almost certainly had to have occurred somewhere between conception and about 30 weeks gestation. So that suggests, in fact, that some sort of insult happens to those children while they are in their mother's womb. That may not explain every case of autism, but in this very small study, it certainly is uh, very concerning and enlightening about just when are our children, when are the children who have autism exposed in such a way that their brain is actually uh, rendered much different in its capability to function than what a normal brain is. I think most people that would be wa are watching this interview would ask themselves, well, what can be done? Uh, one of the things I mentioned in that article is um, the distinction that is, in fact, growing between how Europe approaches uh, the whole idea of uh, precautionary regulation of chemicals compared to the United States. Between 1960 and, and 1990, the United States had actually led the rest of the world in terms of uh, regulating chemicals. We took a, a precautionary approach, meaning chemicals really needed to be vetted by reasonable studies to make sure that they were appropriate for the public to be exposed to. Since 1990, that leadership has definitely shifted over to Europe. 
such that Europe now has a much different approach than the United States does. In Europe, uh, we, they take very seriously the precautionary principle, which is that chemicals need to be proven to be safe before they're unleashed upon the public. Right now, the opposite approach is being taken in the United States through the EPA, the FDA, uh, the Agriculture Department, and that is chemicals virtually have to be proven to be harmful to the public before they can take an, be taken off the market. Not to, and so that, that's obviously, obviously an issue of we're addressing their potential harm clearly after the fact and not preemptively. Yeah, we're all beta testers, essentially. Yeah, we're, we're all being allowed to be guinea pigs. And in the case of children and uh, developing human embryos, the impacts can be irreversible and lifelong, and that gets back to the whole issue of autism. If, if you allow a pregnant mother to be exposed to a lot of these kinds of chemicals that we know are linked to this sort of severe uh, abnormal brain outcome, then you change that person's uh, lifetime of career earnings, educational opportunities, their ability to interact with other human beings, even their behavior. So it's, it's something that we should be taking a lot more seriously than we are. The federal government isn't taking it seriously enough. State governments aren't taking it seriously enough. In fact, there, as far as I can tell, nobody in government at any level is taking this epidemic seriously. Well, Brian, uh, I want to thank you for being on Truth Out Interviews. The article is called Autism Nation, America's Chemical Brain Drain. Thanks again for being on Truth Out Interviews. Thanks for having me. I want to thank you for watching Truth Out Interviews. I'm Ted Asfragadu. See you next time.